Welcome to today's lecture on email communication and etiquette. I'm Dr. Rick Curry. The Gettysburg Address. It was 271 words long. Last week, I received an email from an old colleague suggesting we get coffee and catch up. It was 367 words long. Now, I know coffee is important, but hey, if Lincoln was able to eloquently tell a divided nation about the importance of humanity and equality in only 271 words, I personally think we should be able to send work-related emails that are just a little bit shorter. When that happens, we end up this actually a pretty good representation of what I look like as I read that email. And you too inevitably will find yourself at times just perplexed when you receive an email. When it's unclear and you're uncertain what exactly the purpose of that email is or what it is that someone's asking you to do. And this is going to be important, especially within the context of business and professional communication, because you're all going to be working at some point. Before we get started, here is a, a funny tweet that I saw recently uh, that reminds me a lot of times of my students. Me in class, not retaining anything, the professor is teaching. So there's your teaching funny before we get started today. But this topic is going to matter to you, and it's going to be important because of your desire to have professional careers. So in 2017 alone, over 269 billion emails were sent and received each and every day. Now that figure is expected to increase to over 333 billion emails a day in 2000 and by 2022. In the time that it took you to read that last slide or the sentence here, over 20 million emails were written. That is just a staggering statistic. Over 65% of all me emails that are sent are actually spam. So more than half of all me emails that are generated each and every day are actually spam emails. They're fake emails. Um, most of that is caught by our search filters, but like, like me, I'm sure you guys also get a lot of spam that does make it through to your inbox. A few other things that we know about email, 11.2, uh, that's the average time spent reading and answering emails per week for the average professional employee. That's almost a third, 28% of a 40-hour work week spent just simply reading and responding to emails. And that's why we need to take a little bit of time and understand how we can better communicate professionally via email. Another interesting fact here that I saw, 27% um, of all emails are now opened on a mobile device, 20% from smartphones, 6% from tablets. So we need to have some consideration when we craft our email messages uh, that we'll look at in today's lecture that will help uh, with the fact that a lot uh, that more and more people are accessing their emails via um, smart uh, smart devices. So, what's a day in the life of a corporate email user look like? Well, 25% of working professionals state that they have sent an email late at night just to show commitment. There's something about sending an email at 11 p.m. that tells your boss, "Hey, I'm still thinking about this, or I'm working on this." Uh, now, there's a lot of different philosophies on whether or not we should separate work-life balance, but 25% of professionals say they have done that. 76% of email users say they have sent uh, emails that they have later regretted, right? So 76% of people say, hey, I've sent an email and I regretted sending that. 40% of people have deleted emails by mistake. So those are some interesting statistics. 57% of people spend half their working day on email. That's incredible. Over half of people, uh, professionals working, say they spend over half of their day working on email. So if businesses exist to make money, well, um, you can tell if you're, all you're doing is half your day is reading and responding to email, you're probably not going to be very productive. So what can we do about this? Well, the very first thing that we want to start looking at is subject lines. And subject lines is something that maybe you really haven't put a lot of thought into. 
uh, you've likely not been taught how to craft a professional subject line or a working subject line. And so I come from the professional field. I spent 10 plus years in the financial services industry. Um, I learned that within business settings, specific actionable subject lines are very important in terms of helping ensure that uh, your email one is read and that your email that you're proficient in your use of email. So 64% of people say that they open an email because of the subject line. So they see that subject line and that signifies importance and they open it based off of that. 33% of email recipients open email based on the subject line alone. That's all they're looking at. And 22% say that a personalized subject uh, subject line in an email uh, is more makes them more likely to open that email. So if it's something that is personalized, they're more likely to open it. That's important. So we look at what we call the engagement funnel and the engagement funnel simply says that when we get an email, the first thing we do is we read the subject line. That's the very first thing we do. Um, if that subject line makes sense to us or we recognize it or we think that it's important, we will then open that email, we will then read that email, we will understand that email, and then we'll act. Well, maybe we'll, we will respond, we'll do whatever action it is that email is asking us to do. Now that's called an engagement funnel and that's how it works if you have a subject line that is proficient uh, with your email. Now uh, a broken funnel is you can see here that nothing below read the subject line happens because they will read the subject line and if it's not specific or doesn't invoke action or importance, people will automatically either delete that email or they will simply uh, ignore it for the time being. They'll say, oh, I'll go back, I'll read that later. Well, 69% of the time, research tells us that if you, say you, if, you, if you delay reading an email with the intent of going back later, you don't actually go back, right? So you can see the importance that begins with simply having a efficient subject line. And so I'm going to teach you a few tips and tricks that I used in the professional world that really helped me be successful with my email communication. So descriptive subject lines are important because that is what describes, that subject line is what describes the contents and attachments in a short sentence to the reader of your email. So a bad example of a subject line would be, how's it going? I get these all the time, how's it going? Now that could be how's it going, how a project is going, how is class going, it depends who is emailing me that, but I get subject lines like this all the time. It tells me nothing. It's not specific, it doesn't have an action, it, tells, it, it, it is not a, a good use of a subject line. I generally uh, don't open these emails, I especially don't open those emails immediately. Now again, I, have the, uh, I attempt to go back and open them later, but hey, I get busy. And if I'm busy, that email gets pushed further and further and further down, and it may not be something that I ever actually open. So that is a very vague and non-specific subject line. It lacks awareness. It doesn't indicate a purpose or a call to action. So here's how we might rewrite it to be more clear. You could say something along the lines of update requested, status of Titan project. That would be a more efficient descriptive subject line there. So uh, you could actually add the word urgent in front of it if it was an urgent request. And we're going to talk about what that means here in a bit. You could say urgent, update requested, status of Titan project. Now, I've put together five foolproof subject line prefixes that I have used in my 10 plus years of professional experience that always work for me. Um, in my emails, I always use these five um, some variation of these five subject line prefixes and they have served me well and so I want to pass that along and forward that information on to you. We're going to talk about each of these. You can use update or update regarding and this is used when you want to notify recipients of, of information that has changed or updated or maybe you need to request an update. The second thing is a request, uh, prefix of request. This notifies recipients that an action is required. When you see request included in a subject line, um, you automatically know as the recipient of that email that someone is asking you to do something. So there's a call to action 
that is indicated by the word request, and that's why it's sufficient uh, in emails. Attached. Attached notifies recipients that there's an important file or document enclosed in an email. The fourth uh, subject line prefix I like is follow-up, and that's pretty self-explanatory. We use that to follow up uh, with recipients in the email. And five, just because. I use that for anything else. When you include just because, that signifies non-importance. That tells the email uh, recipient that they don't have to immediately read that, that there is no uh, important information enclosed, there's no request or call to action. And lastly, you'll see the note here that you can add urgent before any of these to indicate importance when immediate feedback is desired. I suggest you only use the word urgent if you need information back, say by end of that day or 24 hours, and you need to note, note you can notate that in your subject line, urgent, um, request required today, and then colon whatever your request is. So let's look at these in a little bit more detail. So the very first subject line prefix there you see is update or update regarding. And again, this is used to notify recipients of updated information. So an example here would be uh, update regarding colon, and then you just put what your update is, right? So next week's communication class assignments. Now you'll see there next week indicates that it's happening in the future. It's not immediate. It is not within the next 24 hours or 48 hours. So it's not urgent. If it were urgent, I could put urgent update regarding change to this week's reflection assignment. So you see some key changes here that are important to highlight. So you see this week's reflection, um, which indicates a greater sense of urgency, which corresponds with the word urgent. And you see the specifics, whereas the first one's more vague. Update regarding next week's communication class assignments. The second one, urgent update regarding change to this week's reflect, reflection assignment. If you're going to use urgent in a subject line, it needs to be very specific. People need to be uh, need to actually be able to see without opening that email uh, what the gist or, or basic understanding of that email is. So use update or update regarding to notify recipients of updated information. The second uh, prefix is request. And again, this is used to notify recipients that an action is required. So an example of a subject line here might be request. Your preferences for company, picnic, date, and times. Maybe your company is having a small get-together in a few weeks and you need to know what people's preferences for what day that um, will occur or time. So if it's a few weeks out, it's not urgent. Uh, so you're just going to say request your preferences for. And that's going to indicate to the uh, recipients of that email that you want something from them. You are requesting them to do something. So there's your call to action. We could use uh, show this with urgent. Urgent, request your feedback on delays with Titan Project. So uh, maybe it's, uh, right, if this is important and you have to update your boss or you have to in update an important group of clients or people about a project that you're working on that um, has been delayed, well, and you need that feedback immediately or soon, then you can use the word urgent in addition to the word request, and again, that indicates a call to action, and it indicates the importance behind that. The third thing here is with attachments, and I use the prefix attached to notify recipients that a file or document is enclosed within that email. So an example here would be attached, lunch menu from Red Robin. Maybe you guys are gonna do, your office is going to do lunch, and you're gonna do lunch at Red Robin, and so you get the email attached, lunch menu, from Red Robin. That's not important. It's, well, it probably is important to a lot of us, but it's not urgent. If we look at an urgent example, we might say urgent, attached, parking instructions for Saturday's training. Maybe it's Thursday or maybe it's Friday and you're wanting to update people uh, in regards to instructions for how they're going to be, uh, need to park on Saturday, then you will include that urgent attached parking instruction for Saturday's training. Again, if you say something is attached, please make sure it is actually attached before you send your email. We have all done this where we've sent an email and we've said, um, I'm attaching or enclosing the following, and then we didn't do it, 
And then we had to email that person or those people back again and say, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to actually attach the file. It's not a good feeling. It's embarrassing um, and, and it wastes people's time. So if you say something is attached, please make sure that you double check your email before you actually send it to make sure that you have uh, attached it. A lot of current uh, emails, uh, Gmail actually I believe does it. If you have attached in the subject line, Gmail will notify you if you try to send that. It will say, uh, it looks like you're attaching a document, but we don't see one. Are you sure? So that's a nice, uh, a nice thing uh, that happens when you have the word attached in the actual subject line uh, that can help you. The fourth thing here is fourth prefix is a follow-up. Now similar to update, but follow-up is generally used when we want to follow up on a meeting or a correspondence that probably wasn't electronic. So you're not following up in regards to an email. Um, sometimes you can, but maybe that if that email was weeks ago, you could use follow-up. But maybe you've had a conversation with your boss or you've had a conversation with someone that wasn't electronic. Maybe you went out to lunch or uh, you had coffee with someone and you wanted to follow up regarding this conversation. So the subject line there would read, follow up our conversation regarding fill in the blank. And that way when that person receives that email, they are going to automatically know that your request is for a follow up regarding a specific conversation. Now we can see here an example of how you might use urgent, right? You could say urgent follow-up regarding the Austin business trip 213-19. Now, what you, when we use the word urgent here, the, it's important because maybe the Austin business trip is only a few days away and there's an important information or follow-up that you need to have regarding that. So you wanna use the word urgent there because that indicates the importance. Now the fifth and final subject line prefix that I personally have used and enjoy is just because. And I use that when I, there's any other correspondence. Now usually this is non-work related and it's not important. So when someone sees just because they know, hey, this isn't an urgent email, this isn't something that I have to respond to right away, etc. And so the subject line could simply be something along the lines of uh, just because super cute cat video or just because I saw this and thought you would like it that indicates non importance and on that note I think we need some cat pics right or cat memes I like these what is it must be a burglar he's wearing a mask and then home alone right we've all been there home alone somebody knocks on the door and we and we look like this poor cat here so those are the five subject line prefixes. So just to note that you can use a combination of prefixes if there's multiple purposes of the message. So for example, you could say attached, workplace diversity training video, and request completion before 2-22-19. So here you're saying, hey, I won't, um, I'm attaching something and I also need a request. You also see, you can see update, travel arrangements for March's Philly trip, and request your meal preferences. Follow up our conversation Saturday and request for networking advice. And lastly, you can see here a combination that might actually have three. Urgent travel arrangements update, March's Philly trip and request for your meal preferences. So I don't even really need to open that email or read that email per se to understand that that last one is urgent, that it's important that it is a request for travel arrangements or an update regarding travel arrangements uh, for uh, uh, an upcoming Philly trip and a request for my meal preferences. So you can see here how descriptive subject lines can help you better use email. And trust me, the people that you work with, your bosses, your colleagues will thank you for your professional use of email subject lines. This is something that I wish 
I had known when I was uh, starting my professional career, but I didn't, I had to sort of learn it by trial and error, but I'm passing this information and knowledge on to you. Again, remember, you only want to use urgent when it's something that's going to happen within the next 24 to 48 hours. Generally at work, I don't use urgent unless it's something that I need done that day or something that really is um, urgent and time, uh, time needing. Now, another benefit of this when you do this is that it creates searchable emails. So when you have good subject lines, good subject lines mean that you're always going to have just searchable emails and that's going to help you keep information organized. So maybe a month from now or two months from now, I want to pull up information that I know I had in an email somewhere, but I simply can't find it. When I go into my email, all I do is click search. I type in the word of the project or what it is I'm looking for. And because I used a proficient professional subject line, it pops up in the search and there it is. And I can easily find any emails related to that. A side note here is that you do want to keep emails organized as well. And what this is referring to is um, don't send a new email just every time just because. If an email already has a chain attached to it, just reply to that chain. There's no need to create a new subject line or a new email unless it is absolutely organized. Now, I want to move on to the second part of professional email communication. And again, this is something that I really was never taught and I wish that I knew. And that is, um, what is the two line, the CC line, and the BCC line used for in an email? A lot of times people just put emails wherever. They send, um, they send this and they're not really certain why they're putting people in the CC line or the BCC line. Well, today we're going to talk about it. So the two line. The two line is when you're going to put anyone on that two line who is in charge or who you want to respond. If you need action from someone, if you need them to do something or to respond or to react, their email is gonna go in that two line. Now these are people's names, um, maybe they're the team members, or if you're, there's 10 of you working on a specific group project or a team, then all 10 members' emails are gonna go in that line because those are each individual people's, or each individual person is uh, in charge, is responsible, uh, and you want a call of action or response from those. There's no upper limit here. So if there's 20 people in the group uh, in which that email is directly relevant to, put all 20 of those emails into that to field, right? So if it's directly relevant, if you want them to respond, put it in the to line. Now the CC line is there, that's called carbon copy, and that just means it's a copy of your original email. So the email is going to go out to everybody into the two line, and then a copy of that email is also going to be sent to everyone in the CC line, carbon copy. Now the CC line is for people who just need to know uh, information, but you don't really need or want them to respond or react. right? So you're keeping someone up to date about something but you don't need them to reply. The second time we use CC is when other people are referenced in an email. So for instance, I work on a safe zone diversity project with a colleague. Her name is Christina. And I get people uh, people emailing me requests for information or follow up all the time regarding this training program. And so because Christina and I work on that together, I put her name in the CC line just so she is made aware that I am sending emails about a program that we're working on together because it's relevant to her, but I do not need her to actually respond. I'll also use this if I email my department chair with an update about where we are with the program or what it is that we're doing in the program. Um, I'll say Christine and I have been working recently on some updates regarding blah, blah, blah within the within the training program. So I put Christina on the CC line just so she's aware that I'm having that conversation with our department chair, but that CC line indicates that she doesn't need to respond. I'm just simply being courteous and respectful to our working relationship and including her in that email so she knows that conversation is happening. So when you're doing that, it goes on the CC line. 
Now you also need to know that anybody's name or address on that CC line, that's going to be visible to everybody who gets that email. So they're going to see that you've copied that person on that CC line. Now we often see this time see this in business emails uh, that CC field uh, to used as a way of showing the recipients of that message that other people are aware of that communication and that the email requires urgent action and needs to be taken seriously. So maybe um, your department has asked you to complete training by a certain date, and a week and a half has gone by and a lot of people still haven't conducted that training. Well maybe then your boss sends out an email that says uh, training has to be completed by this Friday. Please go in and make sure this training is complete per the email that we sent out a week ago. And then you'll look there in the CC line and then maybe they have copied um, your boss's boss or someone very important, or your direct supervisor into that CC line. When you see that, you know automatically, hey, this is important. They've put this other person uh, in, in the CC line so they're aware of this communication, and that spurs us to action because, hey, none of us want to get in trouble at work, so we realize the significance of that when we see that and we do it. So that's another perfect example. Now the BCC, that stands for blind carbon copy. So when you put someone's email into the blind carbon copy, the BCC line, uh, they will also get a copy of that message. However, no one else will see that you have copied that person on the email. So anybody in that two line, anybody in that CC line is also gonna get the email message, but they're not gonna see the names or email addresses of anyone you put in that BCC line. Now, a lot of times we do this simply when there's long mailing list. Um, say for instance, um, the, uh, the D2L system will do this when I email students from, from a class. When I go to email students from a class, I select the class list. It puts all of your email addresses into the BCC line for privacy reasons. You don't know each other. The message isn't directly relevant um, for each of you to respond to each other. And as a result of that, it puts it into the BCC line. So when you get, at, get, get that email, then um, it's just BCC. There's no to list, there's no CC, and it looks like that email only came to you. When in actuality, it went to all of the other recipients of the class. They're just all on that BCC line. So sometimes we do this for, for privacy concerns, and organizations will do that automatically. Now, the second thing um, that we use BCC is when we are copying someone on an email, but we don't want everyone else in that email list to know uh, that we've copied that other person. So maybe your boss, you had a concern about a working relationship with someone in your office and you've talked to your boss about it or maybe you've talked to human resources. And they say, what we want you to do is we want you to have a conversation with that person via email so there's a record. And when you do that, when you have that, make sure that you copy your boss on the BCC line or copy human resources on the BCC line, copy us. That way there is a record of that. Those individuals know that those conversations are happening, but yet that person that you're sending the message to in that two line isn't, is, isn't aware of that. So we can do that also. So now you know the uh, two line, the CC line, and the BCC line. Here's another quick reminder of why we, how we can use this. If it's a primary recipient of the information, that's going to go in the two line. If you're just updating people or wanting to keep people in the loop, it's an FYI, but you don't actually need them to respond, put them in the CC line. Secret person, BCC line. You don't want other people to know that that person is getting a copy of it. Now, I want to conclude that in regards to email etiquette in, with talking about reply to all. Nothing really good ever comes from replying to all. I've been in organizations of thousands of people and, and people will start replying to all and then it becomes just a mass chain of hundreds of emails that you are getting. There really should be a pop-up box that says, hey, are you sure you wanna to reply to all before you reply to all? Only reply to all if every person in that email, every person in that two and CC line needs to know whatever it is that you're going to say. If only the person who sent it needs to know, then reply. Don't reply to all unless your message is relevant to everyone in that email. Here's some 
cute memes that are very applicable. When someone hits reply all and then replies to all to apologize for replying to all. I've seen that. Hey, I'm so sorry I didn't mean to reply to all. Well, thank you. Well, now you've sent two emails that I've had to read and filter out of my inbox. Also, oh, you hate it when people reply all? Well, please reply all and tell us how much. So you'll see long email chains and hundreds of people start to reply and then people will start replying and saying, oh, please stop replying to all. It's annoying. Well, didn't you just reply to all? And lastly, there is a reason why companies don't really like employees to reply to all, especially on uh, documents that might have attachments, because what if there's a virus in that attachment or a virus enclosed and you reply to all or you forward that to all, now all of a sudden you have spread that and that can be, um, that can be dangerous to the company. So um, some tips, some email communication tips. We've talked about subject lines, the importance of subject lines, when we, who we send emails to, and why we shouldn't reply to all. So here's some things that you can use inside your emails now that you're actually writing them that will help you. The first is keep it short. So short, clear, concise, and easy to read messages are the best. Uh, the research shows if you open up an email and it is a long email, you will close that email out. And again, your intent is to go back and read it later, but in the actuality, we, we very rarely do that. So what I want you to think here is text messages and tweets, right? Tweets limit you to a specific amount of characters. Text messages don't limit you, but people um, generally keep their text messages short because it allows us to easily follow the conversation. We can read it quickly. We can reply quickly. So think of your emails. Professionals will actually tell you your email, unless there is a lot of information that you need to disclose, uh, should, be with, should be five sentences or fewer. That's pretty short. So again, think tweet, think text message, as you write your emails because keeping it short is important. Again, more than half of users say if they open an email and it's too long, they simply won't read it. Respect the time of that individual too. Average executives receive over 125 emails a day. So value that time. If you're sending a long, if all of those people are sending long emails, then again, you can see why over 50% of some professionals say their day is spent simply with email. Um, I also think this is interesting to note here. I saw this and thought it was relevant. When you receive a long personal email, what happens? You try to read it, but then you realize that you also have to respond with a long personal email, and then you panic. If someone sends a super long email, you feel obligated to say something other than Yes, thank you so much, I'll get it done, All right? So then maybe we mark it as unread and then we have this mounting anxiety because we don't want to have to take the time or energy to respond. And then too much time passes and we think, wow, I really needed to reply to that like three days ago. And maybe it's too, is it too late now? Should I not reply? And then there's a point in time that passes. There is no magical number, but it does happen where we just simply say, you know what? Too much time has passed and I'm going to choose not to respond at all. And then you avoid that person because you didn't reply to their email. I get this sometimes as a professor. Listen, I get it. Students will send vague emails. It'll The subject line will be blank or it'll say, hey, I don't open it or it gets pushed to the bottom of my email and then I mean to respond, to open it and respond and I simply just don't get to it. And then when I do finally get to it, it's six days that's passed and I realize that my response is sort of not valid at that point because it was about something that was happening three days ago with an assignment. So I see this myself, but if you were using a clear subject line, then guess what? I'm going to know the importance of that message earlier. The second professional advice I can give you is to cut the fluff, right? Not all emails need warm opens. And warm opens are those nice fluffy things that we say at the beginning of an email. I hope you had a wonderful weekend and that you're well rested and ready for the week. Okay, thanks, right? Sure, fluff is pleasant, but it really can be a waste of time and waste of space in an email, especially if I don't really know you personally 
or if I'm going to see you later. If I'm going to see you in the afternoon's meeting at 4 p.m., then I'll just ask you how your weekend was there. I don't need to fluff up an email and say that. So unless the purpose of your email is truly to reach out and catch up with someone, then let's just assume the following things. One, that we all hope everyone in the office had a good weekend. Second, that you look forward to the upcoming weekend. And third, that generally everyone is doing well, right? And then let's get down to business. I see so much fluffing emails. I hope you had a great weekend. I hope I um, I hope you enjoy your upcoming weekend or the upcoming weekend. I hope you're doing well. That's all fluff. In professional writing, we're busy. Professionals are busy. We simply don't have the time or the need to have the fluff. So get to the point and cut that stuff out of your email. So cut out the extra words, right? I uh, recently had a friend tell me that I was extra and actually extra AF and I didn't know what it meant at the time. So I had to look it up and then I said, you know what? If the shoe fits, wear it. I am a little bit extra. Um, but we all add extra words to our writing, and we do that because it makes the transitions smoother. It can also soften our tone, our soften language, and sometimes we're, we use it to make us sound smarter, right? In academia, you are trained to write that the more the better. The bigger the words that you use, the better your writing, and that's just not true in professional writing. In email, it is your job, it's not your job to craft the world's most perfect letter. That's not the purpose of it. It's to communicate quickly and easily the main points of what it is you're trying to communicate. Some companies, some email clients actually use an email abstract field where when you write a long email, it pops up and says, hey, it looks like you've wrote a long email. The recipient might appreciate a brief summary. Put that summary here and then that will appear at the top of your email. Well, I can tell you if you're doing that, that that person is probably only likely to read the summary they're not going to read the email itself. So that should be a warning to you. Keep it short. The second thing in terms of cutting out the extra words, let's look at an example of how we might do this. So instead of saying at this point in time, I think it would make a lot of sense for us all uh, to all regroup on the issue and come up with a few key points for discussion at our meeting in two weeks that will help us get closer to finding a solution that works for all parties. What's the main point there? What are they trying to say? I wrote that example and I don't even know what it's trying to say. I do actually, but it's it can be confusing when we see things like that, right? So instead, say something like this. At this point in time, doesn't add anything. That doesn't give you any value to that message. And so it doesn't need to be included. Also, the inclusion there of I think it would make a lot of sense is just added unnecessary language. The fact that you're saying I think it would make a lot of sense tells us that whatever it is that you're going to say is probably going to be important. You don't have to preface that by saying, well, it would make a lot of sense. So let's rewrite it more concisely. And that can be done like this. Let's all come up with two to three discussion points on this issue or on the issue before our next meeting. The same exact thing. Just without the extra words. Now everyone on that email thread knows what you're talking about already, and yet there's a clear point to the sentence, and you cut down your word count by 70%. Let's all come up with two to three discussion points on the issue before our next meeting. Right, so there's an example of how you can cut out the extra words. Now the second, uh, the next point I wanna make in regarding, regards to email is clarity. Now you need to be concise, it needs to be short, but not at the sacrifice of being confusing. So emails can be too short, they can be cryptic, they can be confusing, and sometimes they just don't make a lot of sense. So for example, your manager sends an email and says, handle, first, handle Facebook first thing today, MJ. Well, is it concise? Sure. Is it confusing? Absolutely. Do you know what he means? Probably not. So what do they mean by handle? What is it about Facebook that needed to be handled, especially first thing in the day? So though that initial email is brief, you wind up exchanging more emails because now you have to email back and forth. What do you mean? What is it that you want me to look at? 
And so what you've done is you've wasted more time than if you had just included a little bit more information the first time around. So let's rewrite it to be more clear. Handle Facebook user responses first thing today because we had a lot of complaints overnight. MJ. It's still short, it's still concise, but it tells you exactly what it is that you need to do and why it is that you need to do it. You need to look at and respond to the uh, Facebook responses because there were a lot of complaints overnight. Maybe that's in regards to a product or a company, um, but it's a lot more clear. So with clarity, you also want to be smart with your words. Now, this is just a tip that I want to throw in here because this is important if you're ever in a supervisory role, right? Vagueness as a supervisor will create unnecessary stress for people who work for you. For example, if your boss says, Brian, can you see me in my office after 3 p.m. when I return this afternoon? John, and that's his email. Well, that vagueness is going to create stress. You're not going to get any work done all day long because you're going to be worried. What is it that he wants to see me about? Did I do something wrong? Am I getting fired? Are we getting laid off? What, 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 right? That creates uncertainty and vagueness is not a good thing. So let's rewrite, rewrite that to be more clear. Brian, can you stop by my office today and update me on where the team is with a Titan project? I'll be in after three. Thanks, John. Right? So a little bit more clarity there tells your employees exactly what it is that you're expecting from them, why it is that you're wanting to talk to them, and also says, hey, nothing's wrong. I just want to talk to you and get an update in regards to this. And now your employee can, can go throughout their day and, uh, and be productive and effective. So a reminder, a quick recap. Keep your emails concise, short and easy to read. Remember, think text messages and tweets. Right? Second, keep them clear. Be smart with your words and brief in your execution, and that doesn't mean just being short. Make sure you're still being clear with your message. The third, use descriptive subject lines. That's the most professional thing you can do, and it will allow you to easily convey the contents and the purposes of your messages. Use those five that I suggest suggested to you, and I promise you, people will appreciate and respect your emails a lot more as a result of using those. Use the proper etiquette with the two, the CCC and the BCC line. So use those um, effectively and use those how they're intended to be used. And lastly, did you include everything? Include all the hyperlinks, attachments, and information you said that you were actually going to include. If you say it's there, both in terms of content or attachments, make sure it's there. You don't want people emailing back and saying, um, I don't see the attachment or uh, I don't see the date for the project that you put in there. So make sure everything is there. If you use these e email communication tips uh, provided, uh, you will be a more efficient, uh, productive uh, professional. As always, any questions or concerns, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you.